Hello to everyone at home. I can see you all coming in. It's very exciting. I'm here with Professor Noam Chomsky. Good evening. Lots of people still coming through. Uh, welcome to Canada China Focuses event, Canada at a Crossroads with China. Um, um, my name is Bianca Mujeni. I'm the director of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Um, and you are here live with myself and Professor Noam Chomsky um, for Canada at a Crossroads with China. Um, great to see you. There's, there's all, already over 400 people that have joined and, and, and I can see lots more people joining. We're live on Facebook, we're live on Zoom. Um, I wanna wish everybody as we're uh, waiting for the webinar to begin, a happy Lunar New Year um, to all of you, as well as a happy Black History Month to all. Um, I've been looking so forward to what I'm sure will be an incredibly memorable and important event. Um, welcome, Professor Chomsky. So great to see you. Um, again, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, this is Canada at a Crossroads with China, Work Together or Perish Together, uh, featuring Noam Chomsky. Um, so I think there's enough of us here for me to get started. Um, I'd like you all to know that uh, we are, this initiative is, uh, is an initiative of the Canada China Focus, um, which is a project of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, as well as the University of Victoria Centre for Global Studies. And uh, tonight's event is also being supported by the University of Victoria's uh, Centre for Asia Pacific Initiatives. And we just want to give a big thanks to them for helping us to spread the word. And um, the links to find out about all of these groups um, can be found in, in our chat. So please do sign up. Sign up for Canada China Focuses um, uh, email list for upcoming events and information. Um, we've got lots that's gonna be coming through soon. So for today, in terms of um, how the event will shape up, we're gonna be hearing a word of introduction from our organizers um, this evening before moving on to the main uh, presentation from Noam Chomsky. Um, and then this is going to be followed by a discussion uh, between our respondents, uh, MP uh, Elizabeth May, uh, Kimberly Wong, and Joey Hartman. And as an audience, you will also have a chance to submit questions, which we'll be taking at the end of today's session. So before we begin, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, that I'm hosting this event um, from Montreal or Jojage, which is on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga people and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, again, for those who are just joining, we're live on Zoom as well as Facebook. And for anyone that wants to share this event to your Facebook page as we broadcast, the link is in uh, facebook.com slash Canada policy. Um, so I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is one of the hosts for tonight's uh, organizations and our institute challenges unjust foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between the perception and role of Canada's, uh, uh, bridge the perception and reality rather of Canada's role in the world while working to oppose the racism that's embedded in Canadian foreign policy. So you can find us at foreignpolicy.ca. And if you like events like these, uh, please do consider donating at, at foreignpolicy.ca slash donation. So the chat is open. It's great to see all of you folks at home. Um, hello, hi, Sven. Hi, hi, Kayla. Hi, everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, please do let us know the traditional territories you're tuning in from. We love to hear from you. Um, as always, please do keep your comments civil, cordial, and free, free from racist or sexist or otherwise harmful commentary. And I'd also like to note that Canada China Focus was founded amidst deep concern about the current upsurge of anti-Asian racism uh, and xenophobia in Canada that's been affecting communities across the country. So again, we're here with world-renowned intellectual linguist, author, dissident, uh, Noam Chomsky for Canada at a Crossroads with China. Um, and uh, you'll be hearing a bit more from John Price, who will be co-moderating this, moderating this session with, as well as Martin Bunton. Um, and I also just want to note that we're getting a lot of help behind the scenes um, from Kayla Klim, Jody Walsh, um, from the University of Victoria Center for Global Affairs, as well as Jess, Jessica McVicker, um, who've all been working very hard to make this event possible. So we're thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have so many of you uh, on this call, uh, particularly given the importance of 
this afternoon's topic. So today in Canada, it's impossible to pick up a newspaper without being uh, bombarded or overwhelmed by the anti-China panic that's been sweeping through Canadian politics. And it's terrifying to witness the ramping up of tensions um, and what, what feels like drum beats to war. You know, every week there seems to be a new development. It's just one thing after another. Today, the Liberals have joined a US-led diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. In recent weeks, opposition MPs demanded the government conduct a national security review of Chinese firms, uh, of a Chinese firm's purchase of a Canadian listed company that's extracting lithium in Argentina, not even Canada. Um, we've all heard, you know, the endless claims that Huawei is a threat to Canada's G5 network, 5G network. And last year, the House of Commons unanimously voted to condemn China. We're seeing a push in the media for a foreign registry, uh, foreign agent registry focused in China. And incredibly, one of the main groups uh, pushing for this, the McDonald Laurier Institute, um, received funding from the US State Department and, and US Embassy in Ottawa for, for this work. Uh, in recent um, months, worryingly, Canadian vessels have run provocative maneuvers with US warships through the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. And um, while it's grown significantly in recent years, it's, it's also really important to acknowledge that Canadian hostility towards China is not new. Um, even before Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping took office as president, the Canadian press reported Canada is seeking a deal with Singapore to establish a military staging post there as part of its efforts to support the United States pivot towards Asia to counter a rising China. And this was in 20, 2012. Um, historically, after World War II, Canada provided armaments and aid to forces fighting Mao's communists. And after Mao's victory in 1949, external affairs memo complained, China must now be regarded as a potential enemy state. Um, Otto refused to recognize the Chinese government until 1970. And in the early 1950s, the Korean War was, was partially a war against China. Um, that saw an incredible 27,000 uh, Canadian troops uh, participating in a war that saw millions killed. So back to present day, we have a situation where the military, arms companies, intelligence apparatus have effectively whipped up a scare about, you know, the supposed China threat, um, a threat that China poses. And we'll be hearing lots more about that today. Um, so you know, these sectors, these parts of, corp parts of corporate Canada are really shaping policy and discussion around China. And, uh, and yet amidst our overlapping crises, we don't need fear mongering, we need international cooperation. And so I'm really looking forward to discussions that are held outside uh, of those who want to follow Washington and corporate interests seeking to profit from the Chinese market. So today's conversation and the Canada-China Focus is designed to open up a space for internationalist, ecological, and anti-racist-minded discussions uh, about Canadian policy towards China. So on that note, we'll be hearing a word from Martin Bunton uh, from the University of Victoria's Centre for Global Affairs. Welcome, Martin. Okay. Thank you, Bianca. My name is Martin Bunton. I am the acting director at the Center for Global Studies. I'm filling in for Oliver Schmitka, who is currently on our research leave. I work here with a wonderful team that Bianca has already acknowledged, but let me thank Kayla and Jody again for all of their help in bringing together this exciting Zoom webinar. Now, over a thousand of us are meeting virtually at this moment, but here at the Center for Global Studies, daily we work, learn, gather on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples, and we acknowledge and respect the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, whose historical relationships with the land and waters continue to this day. Just very briefly, let me note how pleased we are at the Center for Global Studies to be working with Bianca and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute to support the Canada-China focus in its efforts to both facilitate much needed critical and constructive debates on matters related to Canada-China relations and to ensure that these conversations are not only conducted in a safe and anti-racist space, but that these discussions play a role in countering the impact of Sinophobia. So we're very grateful to John Price, to the Advisory Committee of the Canada-China Focus for fulfilling this important vision through such important public conversations as the one today with Noam Chomsky and the very exciting panel of respondents. So thank you to all of you.
Thank you so much, Martin. Wonderful to hear from you. Um, we're now going to be hearing from uh, my co-host, John Price, who will also be moderating the Q&A with respondents after uh, Professor Noam Chomsky's remarks. And John Price is on the advisory board, uh, advisory group of Canada China Focus. He's a longtime social activist and emeritus professor at the University of Victoria. He's author of Orienting Canada, Race, Indigeneity, and the Trans-Pacific. And he sat on the advisory board of the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars, uh, which, uh, which Noam Chomsky also sat on. It's so great to be here with you today, John. Welcome. Thanks, Bianca. I'm speaking to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, also known as Vancouver. As you mentioned, I'm on the advisory board of Canada China Focus. We came together out of concern that the upsurge of anti-Asian racism in Canada was at least in part the result of anti-China propaganda, and that this was adversely shaping public public discourse about Asian Canadians, as well as Canadian foreign policy on China. Let me be clear, to have criticism about China is not racist. But when China's diverse peoples with varied opinions is reduced to an unthinking monolith, when images in the media project China as a militaristic horde bent on aggression, when China is blamed for everything from COVID-19 to housing unaffordability, to money laundering, as well as the opioid crisis. And when Asian Canadians are being attacked in the streets or on the bus, making Vancouver, for example, the anti-Asian hate crime capital of North America, we have crossed a line. Part of this stigmatization arises because of pressure from Washington, but the Trudeau government seems determined to align us ever more closely with US foreign policy whether it be regarding Ukraine or provoking and encircling China as part of a so-called Indo-Pacific strategy. We shouldn't underestimate the forces that have been unleashed. Canada is part of the international spy network made up of the US, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, the so-called Five Eyes. This is a network of settler colonial states. It is a racist state formation dominating the Anglosphere. As Edward Snowden has revealed, it is the biggest and most dangerous cyber spy network in the history of the world, and Canada is now heavily involved in cyber attacks itself. Peggy Mason of the Rideau Institute recently pointed out how the Five Eyes are engaging in scope creep, interfering in unprecedented ways in Canada. As a branch of the Five Eyes, CSIS has become incredibly aggressive. That includes going after researchers with links to China, targeting in particular Chinese Canadians, as Pro Professor Xiaobei Chen and Senator Yan Pao Wu pointed out in our last webinar. Despite their protests that CSIS is actively engaged in racial profiling, the response of university presidents in Canada and faculty associations seems inadequate to say the least. We're blessed to have somebody like Professor Chomsky, as well as a terrific group of respondents to talk about these and other issues as well. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Welcome, Noam, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, John, for that. Um, I, uh, I now, you know, I'm just, I have, to, I have to give a big shout out to John because he's been so instrumental in uh, bringing together the Canada China Focus and getting this going. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for those comments and for the bringing in that Canadian perspective. So I now have the profound pleasure of uh, introducing world-renowned dissident Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky is a linguist, a professor, a philosopher, a cognitive scientist, historian, social critic, and political activist. He's one of the most cited scholars alive. Um, Noam Chomsky is considered a founder of, mo of modern linguistics and has published over 100 books on linguistics, war, politics, and mass media, including his recent Requiem for the American Dream. He's been an anti-war activist for over 60 years and continues to challenge systems that have brought us to the brink of climate catastrophe and nuclear annihilation. Uh, Noam Chomsky taught linguistics at MIT from 1955 to 2017 and is currently a laureate professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. Welcome, Professor Chomsky. Thank you very much. Well, I won't 
presume to speak about Canada directly, but uh, my own feelings about what Canada should do ought to be clear from these remarks. Uh, the prevailing view in the United States, much of the West, is that China is a rising superpower aim, aiming to confront the United States. And perhaps as uh, has been widely predicted for many years, it's even poised to surpass the United States and to dominate world affairs. Uh, Harvard professor Graham Allison, among others, has argued further that the so-called Thucydides trap is likely to lead to a US-China war. That cannot happen. A US-China war simply means game over. Uh, there are critical global issues on which the United States and China must cooperate. They will either work together or collapse together, bringing the world down with them. The US-China conflict is real, but it's important to recognize that it's sharply asymmetrical. It's actually, its nature was captured inadvertently by a headline in the New York Times a few days ago. It said, as the United States pulls back from the Mideast, China leans in, expanding its ties to Middle Eastern states with vast infrastructure investments and cooperation on technology and security. That's the headline. Unintentionally, the headline captures quite accurately what's happening all over the world. The United States is withdrawing military forces that have battered the Mideast region for decades. In sharp contrast, China's expanding its influence with so-called soft power, investment, loans, technology, development programs, and not just in the Mideast, of course. The most extensive Chinese project is the huge Belt and Road Initiative that's taking shape within the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Organization includes uh, the Central Asian states, uh, India, Pakistan, Russia, no, Iran, it's reaching to Turkey, probably on to Central Asia, Central Europe. It may well include Afghanistan. If Afghanistan can survive its current catastrophe, apart from being an important transit point, Chinese aid and development might manage to shift the Afghan economy from heroin production for Europe, as it's been under US control, to uh, use of its uh, rich mineral resources. Now, that prospect, not unlikely, would again contrast sharply with the current US policy of strangling Afghanistan uh, by even withholding its own funds kept in New York banks while the Afghans starve. The Belt and Road Initiative has offshoots in the Middle East, including Israel. There are accompanying problem, uh, programs in Africa, now even Latin America over strenuous US objections. A couple of days ago, China announced that it's taking over the manufacturing facilities in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that Ford had recently abandoned. And a huge investment will initiate large-scale electric vehicles production. It's an area in which China's far ahead. The United States has no way to counter these efforts. Bombs, missiles, 
special forces raids in rural communities. They don't just work to counter these efforts. Actually, it's an old dilemma. 60 years ago in Vietnam, US counterinsurgency efforts were stymied by a problem that was despairingly recognized by US intelligence and US province advisors. The Vietnamese resistance, the Viet Cong in US parlance, they were fighting a political war, a domain in which they were strong and the US was weak. The US was responding with a military war, the arena in which it's strong, but that couldn't appeal, couldn't overcome the appeal of the PC programs to the peasant population. Major problem that was openly recognized 60 years ago. Well, the only way the Kennedy administration could react to the VC political war was by initiating US Air Force bombing of rural areas, authorizing napalm, large scale crop and livestock destruction, other programs to drive the peasants to virtual concentration camps where they could be protected, as was said, from the guerrillas who the US knew they were supporting. Won't go into the consequences, we know them. Er earlier in the 50s, the dilemma had been explained by John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, addressing the National Security Council about the problems the US was having with Brazil where elites, he said, quoting him, elites are like children with no capacity for self-government. Uh, we're still, in Dulles's words, the US is hopelessly behind, is hopelessly far behind the Soviets in developing controls over the minds and emotions of unsophisticated peoples, the population of the global South even educated elites. Dulles lamented to President Eisenhower about what he called the communist ability to get control of mass movements, something we have no capacity to duplicate. The poor people are the ones they appeal to, and they have always wanted to plunder the rich. Well, Dulles left unsaid the obvious corollary the poor people somehow don't respond well to our appeal to the rich to plunder the poor. So with great reluctance, we have to turn to the arena of violence where we dominate. That's not unlike the dilemma posed today when China, quote the headline again, China, China leans into the global south by expanding its ties with vast infrastructure investments and cooperation on technology and security. That's one central element of the China threat that's eliciting such fear and anguish. Well, the asymmetry is revealed further by direct comparisons of the United States and China. In every major dimension, the US is far ahead and has natural advantages shared by no other power in the entire, in entire history. In the military dimension, the United States stands alone in the world. It has 800 military bases worldwide, many of them with nuclear tipped missiles threatening China directly off its Eastern coast. China has one in Djibouti, one US nuclear sub with Trident missiles can obliterate almost 200 cities worldwide. China has nothing remotely comparable. Washington's current approach to the threat of China is called encirclement. Containment is 
considered out of date. Cont encirclement includes formation of the Quad, US, India, Japan, Australia, supplements AUKUS and the Anglospheres, Five Eyes, all of them strategic military alliances confronting China. China has only a troubled hinterland. The radical military imbalance in favor of the United States is now being enhanced by the latest AUKUS achievement, the plan to provide Australia with a fleet of nuclear submarines to extend already overwhelming US military dominance in the seas that are critical for Chinese commerce. United States official national security strategy set by Trump, renewed by Biden, is designed to prevail in a war with China or Russia or both China and Russia simultaneously. In order to achieve this objective, military spending, which of course dwarfs all others in the world, was greatly enhanced by Trump, now even more so by Biden, and the bipartisan Congress expanded it even more beyond what Biden asked for. If there's a better definition of insanity, it would be enlightening to hear it. In fact, we did hear it a few weeks ago. In the final days of 2021, December 27th, uh, Biden signed the National Defense Authorization Act. I'll quote it. Calls for an unbroken chain of US armed sentinel states stretching from Japan and South Korea in the Northern Pacific to Australia, the Philippines, Thailand and Singapore and in the South and India on China's Eastern flank meant to encircle China. Well, ominously enough, military analyst Mike Clare adds, Taiwan too is included in the chain of armed sentinel states. And his word, ominous, is well chosen. China, of course, regards Taiwan as part of China, as does the United States formally, at least. The official US One China policy recognizes Taiwan as part of China with a tacit agreement that no steps will be taken forcefully to change its status. Uh, Trump and his Secretary of State Pompeo chipped away at the formula. It's now being driven to the brink. China is offered the choice of either succumbing or resisting, and they're not going to succumb. This is only one component of the program to defend the United States from what's called the China threat. Complementary policy is to undermine China's economy by means too well known to review. In particular, China must be prevented from advancing in the technology of the future, actually extending its lead in some areas, such as electrification and renewable energy, the technologies that might save us from our race to destroy the environment that sustains life. Uh, one aspect of these efforts to undermine China's progress is to pressure other countries to reject superior Chinese technology. As you know, it's a live issue right now in Canada. Well, the devious Chinese have found a way to get around these efforts. They're planning to establish a thousand technical schools in countries of the South to teach advanced technology, that is Chinese technology, which graduates will then use uh, again, the kind of aggression that's hard to confront. 
Well, without proceeding, the asymmetry is dramatic. Uh, there are, of course, an array of arguments to justify these US programs. As usual, they resonate through the US information system with virtually no challenge. Uh, nevertheless, they merit a little thought. One central claim is that the United States must undertake these steps in order to punish China for its human rights violations, which are doubtless severe. And we can easily assess the sincerity of this stand. Very simple. It suffices to look at US military aid around the world. At the very top, in a category by themselves, are Israel and Egypt. On the Israeli record of human rights, it's enough now to refer to the recent detailed reports of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch reviewing the abuses of what they describe as the world's second apartheid state, the first having disappeared. Turning to Egypt, suffering under the harshest dictatorship of its tortured history, maybe 60,000 political prisoners subject to every imaginable form of torture and abuse, and that's the least of it. Uh, more generally, over the past years, there has been a very striking correlation between US military aid and torture and other severe human rights abuses. There's no further need to tarry on Washington's concern for human rights. Might mention that something similar is happening right now in regard to Ukraine. The main stumbling block in the way of a settlement of this dangerous crisis is Washington's insistence on the sanctity of sovereignty, hence UK, Ukraine's right to join NATO instead of adopting Austrian style uh, neutrality, which prevailed through the entire Cold War. Well, this is lauded as high principle in US commentary. This stand is eliciting loud guffaws in most of the world, certainly the global south, which is not oblivious to Washington's dedication to sovereignty in Iraq, Libya, Serbia, and other cases too numerous to mention. But it passes without comment. Well, another charge is that the United States must counter China's incursions in the South China Sea, which are indeed in violation of international law. Although as the sole maritime power to have rejected the law of the sea, the United States is not in a strong position to advance this charge. The problem is real. It is a regional problem that can and should be dealt with by the states of the region not by militant acts of the global hegemon. Now here too, there's an instructive similarity to Ukraine. Analysts have been puzzled by Washington's insistence on fanning the flames in contrast to Europe's more temperate stance. Well, even Ukraine is calling on the United States to tone down the fevered rhetoric the basic contours of a settlement in Ukraine are well understood and feasible, but there's a downside. It would be a regional settlement, not imposed by the United States, which would therefore not remain in charge. That raises a long-standing issue in post-World World War II global politics. I'm sure you recall the slogan that the purpose of NATO 
is to keep the Germans down, the Russians out, and the Americans in, where in means in charge. Well, the Germans are down, the Russians are out, so where do Americans find themselves? That depends on the resolution of a long-standing conflict between two conceptions of global order involving Europe. One is an Atlanticist order run by Washington, that's NATO. Alternatives have been floated by a series of European statesmen. The goal with his call for Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals, Willy Brandt with his Ostpolitik, Macron with his current initiatives towards Russia that are causing much displeasure in Washington. And in the background is the international order that was proposed by Mikhail Gorbachev as the, United, as the USSR was collapsing 30 years ago. He proposed a European security system from Lisbon to Vladivostok with no military blocks. Common home was rejected firmly by President Bush number one. NATO must remain, the Warsaw Pact must disappear. Well, NATO not only remained, but a few years later under Clinton, then Bush number two, NATO expanded to the Russian border in violation of US promises to Russia in return for its agreement to permit German unification within a hostile military alliance. No small concession for Russia in the light of past recent history. Well, notice that in both Europe and Asia, the United States is opposing regional settlements that would undermine the global dominance that established after World War II, enhanced with the collapse of the Soviet Union. These critical issues are beyond discussion in the United States, They're virtually beyond imagination. This stance is revealed in other ways. This morning, this morning's New York Times, there's a front page story, which has the headline, I'll read it, House passes bill adding billions in research to compete with China. The vote sets up a fight with the Senate, which has different recommendations of how the United States should bolster its technology industry to take on China. Well, the assumptions are interesting. Could Congress support research and development because it would help American society as it would? Apparently not. That's not a consideration. Can only do it because it would take on China. Well, Republicans oppose the bill because it doesn't go far enough in confronting China. Republicans also oppose irrelevant initiatives such as addressing climate change. How does the most important issue in human history help to compete with China, the one issue that we have to be concerned with. Interesting assumptions when you think them through. Well, returning to the charges against China, it's also claimed that US naval operations in the contested areas are a principled effort to uphold freedom of navigation, which is not under the slightest threat and never has been in the South China Sea. The issue is quite different. It's discussed prominently in Australia, 
not in the United States. At issue is a technical question about the law of the sea, which remember the United States rejects the only maritime power. The law of the sea established what are called exclusive economic zones for maritime powers. They do have freedom of navigation for others, but no threat or use of force. That's the wording of the law of the sea. The question is whether military operations constitute threat of force. The United States says no, they don't. China says yes. It's joined incidentally by India, which has also protested US naval operations in its exclusive economic zone. Well, whatever you think about this, it's clearly a matter to be settled by negotiations and diplomacy, along with others that are outstanding, not by sending naval armadas through China's exclusive economic zone, not by building up a huge nuclear fleet of nuclear submarines to severely threaten China, where US predom military predominance is already overwhelming. So what remains of the awesome China threat? That question was addressed by former Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating, right in the reach of the dragon's flaws. He ran through the various arguments, dismissed them, and concluded finally that the threat of China is simple. China exists. That's the threat of China. More fully, China cannot be controlled, cannot be intimidated. It's not like Europe. Europe angrily protests US demands that it strongly opposes, like Washington's murderous sanctions on Iran. Europe protests, but after protesting, it obeys, not China. China is guilty of what secret internal US government documents, since declassified, what they call successful defiance. The term was used 50 years ago to justify John F. Kennedy's terrorist war against Cuba and the crushing blockade that he instituted, which still persists. According to the State Department, such US measures were taken in defense against Castro's successful defiance of US policies going back to the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, which declared Washington's right to dominate the hemisphere. Successful defiance is not tolerated. The concept applies far more broadly. China's alone in the world in that it can maintain successful defiance with impunity. That's an intolerable affront to the imperial order and one that cannot be countered by the usual measures of invasion, subversion, terror, and economic warfare. Well, there's of course a lot more to say about these convoluted matters, but these few remarks seem to me a reasonably fair assessment of the current situation. It's an extraordinarily dangerous one, considering the risks. One fact mentioned at the outset is crystal clear and decisive. The United States and China will either work together on the existential crises that humanity faces, or they will collapse together, bringing the world down with them. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Noam, for that beautiful, brilliant presentation um, and just for highlighting the importance of cooperation if we have a chance to overcome the climate crisis and avoid nuclear Armageddon. And I look very forward to hearing more from you in the upcoming sections of the event. Um, so we're now moving on to the next segment of our evening. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, John Price back as well as Elizabeth May, Kimberly Wong, and Joey Hartman to join us. Welcome, Elizabeth. Welcome, John. Welcome, Kimberly. Over to you, John. Thanks, Bianca. And Noam, thank you for that uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, much appreciated. I've got a ton of questions, but um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our uh, respondents, uh, beginning with Joey Hartman. And let me briefly introduce Joey. Joey Hartman served as the full-time president of the Vancouver and District Labor Council for seven years before retiring in 2018. Today, she still participates on several boards and continues more than 40 years of activism and leadership in the labor movement, including on international affairs. She participated in labor delegations to China in 2006 and 2014, uh, through uh, the Vancouver and District Labor Council and BC Federation of Labor. Over to you, Joey. Thank you. And, and thank you so much, Professor Chomsky, for giving us the historical context that's so important, as well as some uh, contemporary issues that we need to be alert to. And coming from the trade union movement, uh, I think that it's important for us to really think about uh, the workers who are impacted uh, in a global context here as well. And uh, the reason that we participated as the Vancouver and District Labor Council and the BC Federation of Labor in those two delegations, 2006 and 2014, was really to uh, establish worker to worker solidarity, to have a better understanding of the All China Federation of Trade Unions, the AS ACFTU, I should say, and also to build relationship. And I will say that in recent years, uh, that relationship has, has somewhat dropped off uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, COVID is one, but I would also say that particularly in Canada, the foreign relation, um, foreign policy and, and conflicts over things like the famous two Michaels uh, has really provided something of a damper. Uh, but um, we have not only taken two delegations to China, but we had also received many delegations of trade unionists coming to Canada and the US to examine how we operate as trade unions here and to learn about things like collective bargaining um, and as they were trying to move forward. I will say that we had received some criticism from Canadian trade unionists uh, who felt that we should not be engaging with the All China Federation of Trade Unions largely because it's not viewed as having independence from the communist government. Uh, but I would say there's also the undertones of um, really responding to the idea that Chinese workers are stealing our jobs, particularly the manufacturing elements of that. Uh, our response has always been that um, it's important for us to support workers' rights wherever they are, regardless of what government or regime that they are trying to operate within. Uh, a little bit about the All China Federation of Trade Unions. I think many people seem to be surprised that there are in fact unions at all in, in China. Uh, there's really one overarching union, the ACFTU, uh, operates very differently than what we're familiar with, has over 3 million members. Uh, it has universities, hospitals, hotels, and a number of other enterprises. And that when China opened up their economic, uh, their economy to foreign enterprise, there was um, soon after a recognition that the labor, um, labor reform was necessary in order to respond to that. And so it opened up uh, the opportunity to organize in a very easy way, the uh, collective bargaining. And uh, one thing that surprises Canadians was that 2% um, dues are paid, but they are paid by the employer, the, the company, not by the, the workers directly. Um, this all led these labor reforms to a number of high profile actions. There was in 2006, a, um, a move to organize Walmart. And for us in Canada, this was very interesting because 
Um, the year before, Walmart had been organized by the UFCW in a town called Jonquière, Quebec. And Walmart's reaction to that was to shut down the store rather than have a union in place and have done similar actions in the United States. Whereas in 2006, all 62 of the Walmart superstores in China were unionized in one motion. There's also been major strikes in Honda and Toyota in 2010. And also in 2010, a very uh, well-recognized international incident where uh, Foxconn, uh, responsible for um, small telephone manufacturing uh, elements, uh, set up suicide nets in response to the fact that, that their workers were literally jumping off the top of, of dormitory buildings uh, because of the working conditions. And that in fact resulted in some pretty significant improvements. So the, the eye of the world has been on all of this from a, a worker perspective. Um, and certainly we felt through the Vancouver and District Labor Council and other other organizations that it was really important to make uh, have a relationship and to to really help uh, move things uh, in a way that is um, uh, intended for workers. Uh, so unions, by definition, I'm just going to close off here. Is is by definition unions are collective and that we work for the common good. And for decades, we have seen particularly U.S. and Canadian unions, among others. Uh, losing ground to this concept of individualism, individual rights, some will call it freedoms, uh, and corporate capture. Uh, and so that's really also part of the context that we are, are having this conversation in. My question to you then is a very broad one because I think um, you may have lots of thoughts about this, so I'll let you kind of think about where you wanna focus your answer. But the question is, where does the labor movement uh, both within China, but also at the international level, fit into this conversation? And what do you think that we have the potential to do to have positive effect? Thank you. Um, shall I comment now or wait to the end? Thanks, Noam. No. Yeah, we'd yeah. love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you now, No. Well, that's a critically important question. Uh, the last 40 plus years, uh, working people, the poor, even the middle classes, have been subjected to a major assault. It's called neoliberalism. It has an official name, but the actual name for it is savage class war, an attack on working people all over the world. We actually have some measures of it. So in the United States, the Rand Corporation estimated the amount of wealth transferred from the lower 90% of the population, working class, middle class, the poor, transferred from them to the super rich, fraction of 1% if you look closely. And their estimate is about $50 trillion. It's mirrored elsewhere. The globalization systems were set up to, to enhance this. You mentioned the common phrase, Chinese workers are stealing our jobs. Uh, it's efficient corporate propaganda. Corporations and the government are stealing the jobs of working people by designing a particular form of globalization, which would enhance the rights of capital and diminish the rights of labor. Now, the only way of confronting that is the traditional way to deal with class struggle, labor organizing. And since it's international, it means international labor organizing. We might remember that the names of many unions still include the world word international, because that was the goal international solidarity for an international class war, which has been waged with extreme savagery in the last 40, 45 years by the uh, owners of the masters of the world, as Adam Smith called them, the owners of capital. The uh, globalization measures instituted 
during the Clinton years, mainly in the 90s, were explicitly designed to undermine working people and to enhance the rights of private ownership shows up in all kinds of ways. Well, how do you confront this? Labor organizing. When the neoliberal assault was initiated, its planners understood this very well. The people who designed the policies for Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher understood that the first thing they must do is destroy labor unions. So immediately on taking office, Reagan and Thatcher attacked the unions with methods regarded as illegal in most of the world, permanent replacement right worker scabs that opened the door for the corporate sector to do the same. Illegal, but who cares? When there's a criminal state, you can carry out illegal actions. It goes on right to the present. Strike breaking in the United States has become a science. Major enterprises engage in it, carry out extensive efforts. Amazon strike was a recent example, which make it almost impossible for workers to organize. The methods are often illegal. So one effect of NAFTA studied by a US labor historian uh, at Cornell University under NAFTA rules, incidentally, found that a large part of maybe 50% of US organizing efforts were broken up by threats of the business involved to transfer the operation to Mexico. Now that happens to be illegal, but again, with the Clinton administration in charge, a Clint criminal government, doesn't matter. Well, all of that can be overcome, but exactly in the way that you described, by solidarity, joint action among working people, first of all, to rebuild the own, their own shattered labor organizations, especially in the United States, where it's interesting. Support for labor unions in the United States is at an all-time high. Density of union organizing has declined even last year. Can't very hard to overcome these methods that have been instituted during the savage class war of the last 40 years. But it can be done. It's been done before. I can. Thanks very much, Noam. That was great. Uh, I'm going to move us along, if you don't mind. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Joey, for your uh, comment and question. And thanks, Noam. Our second course respondent is uh, Kimberly Wong. Uh, Kimberly, if I may introduce you. Kimberly is a queer Cantonese femme who has been engaged in community organizing around climate justice and anti-racism. Um, they have been recognized by the city and the province for their accomplishments in political and community organizing and their work reflects their intersectional identity. Kimberly, over to you. Thanks for having me, Bianca and John, um, and lovely to share this space with you, Noam, Joey and Elizabeth. Um, just before I speak my piece, I want to offer a note of care and comfort, especially for those who are like myself of the Chinese diaspora, because speaking about this in this moment is traumatic for our communities. Um, so I hope you have a warm blanket or pillow to hug nearby. Um, I'm joining from unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh territory, and uh, my name is Kimberly Wong. I organize with Asian diaspora communities in what's known as Vancouver, including in Chinatown and with uh, Asian and queer youth. So it's not hard to see how global events can and have impacted local communities. And we've heard many times today already how it has. Uh, the pandemic as an obvious example of this had a large impact on Asian communities from all over the world uh, in the diaspora. So in Vancouver, there was an over 700% increase in reported hate crimes. And uh, these were just the ones that were reported to the authorities. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of these were also against Asian women. Um, Asian neighborhoods and businesses, especially restaurants, saw a loss of visitors months before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And the reason this was happening was because people associated the pandemic with uh, what was first discovered in China 
uh, with ethnically Chinese and Asian people in the diaspora in places like Vancouver. And uh, it was easy to, and there is also a capitalistic incentive to see all Chinese people, regardless of migration history or heritage as a monolithic group, as, as John first mentioned. So I think we've made the connection between Canada-China foreign policy and its impacts on diasporic communities of Chinese descent as well, which certainly includes the ways in which we speak about foreign policy in often clerical and sterile terms, as if it doesn't immediately impact these communities. So on the ground, uh, there have been efforts by my community to nuance the ways in which we use the term China so as to not impact Chinese diasporic communities like Chinatown, while still being as critical of the Chinese state for their mistreatment and genocide of Uyghurs, uh, their handling of Hong Kong and their continued human rights violations. So we do things like bringing light to the forever foreigner myth, or despite our complex and diverse histories of migration to places like Canada, go as far back as the 1850s, and uh, even given that, we will always be seen as foreigners um, and doing things like calling out campaigns that use Sinophobic rhetoric to appeal to their audiences, like an anti-pipeline campaign in 2016 using the slogan, Stand Up to China, um, and educating our own communities about historical policies that create a through line to the racism we're experiencing today, which really just comes down to power struggles and so-called racial imbalances observed by white settlers in the 19th century and white supremacy. Um, and also empowering our communities to speak up and form solidarity with other communities impacted by white supremacy to negate the model minority myth that inserts more hierarchies based on observed race and to deny the white supremacist tactic to divide and conquer us. So a couple of questions that I want to pose upon reflecting on these many things uh, is nuancing the way in which we speak about and use the term China by doing something as simple as saying Chinese government instead enough to protect Chinese communities in the diaspora from the blatant racism we're experiencing now? And are there ways to safeguard this from being co-opted by neoliberalism? And also, if all of the harm that we are observing, all of the tensions and all of the issues that we've spoken about and brought forward are because of capitalism, white supremacy, imperialism, and other large systems that were meant to oppress specific groups of people based on categorizations and hierarchies. In your experience and observations over the past many decades, is there no way forward but to abolish all of them and start from anew, or as you've said uh, before in past uh, interviews, let this generation, my generation, decide if organized human society will survive? And if so, how do we address the trauma of those who've been harmed by these systems that were meant to systemically control, abuse, and dehumanize us in the meantime? Is our strongest answer to these harms and trauma things like hyper-localized community care, relational organizing, mutual aid, non-carceral accountability, and uh, matriarchal and indigenous ways of being. What do you think? <laughs> Small questions. Thanks very much, Kimberly. Uh, Noam, uh, anything to say? As you said, a small question. Uh, well, you're right to, to emphasize the fact that the question that your generation faces is survival. Uh, Greta Thunberg was quite right when she admonished the fancy people at Davos that you have betrayed us. That's correct. My generation has betrayed the youth of the world uh, by creating a system which is racing to disaster and there's a resistance you go back to glasgow a couple of weeks ago there were two events that took place at the cop 26 conference in glasgow inside the stately halls the well-dressed ladies and gentlemen were uh, congratulating each other on the wonderful things that they're going to do. What did they do? Said, let's meet next year. Uh, that's what they did do. Meanwhile, the earth burns. Outside in the streets, tens of thousands of young people were demonstrating, saying, we want to survive. We want a world in which we can live and our children can live a world in which we'll work for the common good, not for more profit for those who already have overstuffed pockets. Those are the two. It's one aspect 
of the global class war that's taking place. What can you do? We know how to solve these problems. Crucial to remember that there are answers. Take say the imminent crisis of destruction of the environment. There are very detailed, explicit, feasible proposals. One of them in fact is a resolution on the floors of the US Congress put forth by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez along with Ed Markey, a senior Massachusetts Senator. It reviews in detail exactly what can be done. It's essentially the same program that's developed by the International Energy Agency by a number of economists who've done very serious work on this, like my colleague Robert Pollan for one. It's all there, it's feasible, can't do it if we're busy uh, fighting the alleged China threat, uh, which has the effect of the usual effect of threats is to mobilize the population in uh, to confront some great enemy, overlooking, suppressing the fact that their enemy is those who are calling on them to fight the, the foreign and or local enemy. That's the way race has been used in the United States to divide the working class, try to convince white workers that their enemy is blacks or immigrants or Hispanics. We got to mobilize to protect ourselves against them instead of working together to fight our real oppressors. That's what a foreign threat does. The so-called Russian threat did that for 50 years when it couldn't be sustained anymore because Russia disappeared, new devices were designed. China threat is one of them. It's, it's effect and design is to prevent people from working together to overcome the problems of their own lives and the very severe crises that we th face, including a threat of survival. As you correctly said, well, that has to be overcome the way it's always been overcome by solidarity, mutual aid, support, mutual understanding, all possible, been done before, can be done again. Thanks, Noam, and thanks, Kimberly. Our next respondent is Elizabeth May. Uh, she needs no introduction, but I will mention that she's parliamentary leader of the Green Party of Canada, a lifelong environmental activist. She represents Saanich Gulf Islands on the territory of the Saanich Nation. Elizabeth. Thank you, John, and thank you to Bianca and John for co-hosting, and thank you to everyone. Well, actually, it's just an incredible opportunity to speak to you, Professor Chomsky. Thanks, Kimberly and Joey, for your introductions. I raise my hands to you in the traditions of the Wasanak people acknowledging territory, and in the language of this place, Senchothan, Heishka, Heishka Siam. It's an honor to be with all of you, and I thank you, including the extraordinary over 600 people, or however many there are now, uh, who are observing this. Um, Dr. Chomsky is a long time you know, fan. I'm, I'm, you know, have difficulty finding my words to ask you the question on something as complicated and as nuanced as Canada-China relations. I, I wanna put to you that, number one, I completely agree with where you landed on this conversation. We have to have cooperation. We have to have dialogue. We have to work with the People's Republic of China. But I, I, I challenge some of my friends on the left, how do we, analyze uh, imperialist powers that, that colonialize and oppress other peoples, if it's only the US, it's both. China is an imperialist nation that also colonizes and oppresses the people of Tibet and the Uyghurs, but the United States is, uh, we all know the hege hegemony of the United States over world affairs, the false flag events, the proxy wars have, uh, have oppressed the world for as long as I've been alive, I'm a 1954 baby, Dr. Chomsky. I was born with a mushroom cloud over my crib uh, from my earliest days on the, you know, 
in um, kindergarten, I warned the other children not to eat the snow because of strontium 90. So I have a long memory of the Cold War. And I also don't think that Canada and the US should be allowed to move into a Cold War. It would be, or anywhere, obviously anything more than a Cold War and the rhetoric would be disastrous. But what I find interesting in the current, and I do hear every day in parliament, a kind of a rhetoric, uh, a jingoistic rhetoric of demonizing the People's Republic of China that I, that I think unhelpful. We have to be clear eyed and we have to stand up for human rights as Kimberly was saying. We also have to be aware that uh, just beating a drum as Bianca was saying, a drum of war against People's Republic of China is, is definitely not helpful. The strange anomaly that I wanted to, to put to you and ask for it, what sense do you think it makes that this is all going on? Well, and again on climate, crisis, we don't have time to leave it for Kimberly's generation to fix it. It has to be, we really have to address the climate crisis in the next year or two or three and set a different trajectory towards things like the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to coalitions like the Beyond Oil and Gas Coalition and rather Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance and recognize that at COP26, uh, China was not unhelpful. Uh, the U.S. and the our mainstream media in Canada, if you watch the news about Glasgow, you'd think China had boycotted. Um, Jing, uh, Xi Jinping didn't come, but lead negotiator Xi Jinping, who was one of the key negotiators for the Paris Agreement as well, the consistency of climate diplomacy from China in the negotiations has been overall helpful for many years, including in Copenhagen, where at the end of the failure of negotiations, there was a general condemnation of China of the People's Republic of China as if they were to blame for the failure of the negotiations instead of the government of Denmark and the government of the US that really sabotaged things. But moving to the anomaly, in Canada, you would swear if you watched our parliament, the liberals were cozying up to China and the conservatives were steadfastly against engaging with the People's Republic of China. In the Harper era, the, the most right-wing conservative horrific government we've ever had, Stephen Harper did a secret deal. It never came to Parliament for debate. It didn't come to us for a vote. We are the only one of our allies and partners, not the US, not Australia. We're the only industrialized country that has signed a, an investment protection treaty with the People's Republic of China, which allows China, People's Republic of China to complain to our government in secret negotiate deals, get us to climb down from positions we've taken, abolish environmental laws all in secret under the Canada-China Investment Treaty, which was passed in our cabinet secretly, a treaty that binds us for 35 years, passed by the conservatives that the conservative MPs don't seem to ever recognize, all in the interests of large-scale industrial expansion whether it was in the oil sands or in our forests, more control from the People's Republic of China over Canadian domestic decisions. Um, it, it's, it's an astonishingly anti-democratic treaty. If anyone listening wants to read more about it, uh, a professor at Osgoode Law School named Gus Van Harten wrote a tremendous book called Sold Down the Yangtze about this treaty that we signed in secret. So I, I guess my question is, how do we, take apart all these pieces, because I completely agree with everything you said about what the US wants to do vis-a-vis -vis China, the People's Republic of China. I can't figure out how we pull apart the nefarious same intent as any other major exploiting built on wanting to see economic growth, wanting to see more pipelines, wanting to see more oil and gas. How do we take that apart when the politics in Canada are splitting apart on, I think, a false left-right divide in what we should do related to the People's Republic of China. Well, that's an internal problem for Canada. How do you control your own government, your own ruling classes? It's not unique to Canada. Everyone has the same problem. Uh, at this stage of human civilization, you can't just deal with it on a national level because there's too much international integration. Same policies are being pursued everywhere and in concert. We have an international ruling class. You go back to 
Adam Smith at the be beginning of the modern capitalist era, Wealth of Nations. Uh, he bitterly condemned the people he called uh, the masters of the world, the English merchants and manufacturers. They were the masters of mankind. And as he put it, they work to make sure that they control the government and that the policies of the government work in their interests. Well, that was Adam Smith 250 years ago. What's changed is that no, it's not. It's the masters of the world are international and they also control, work to control the governments of their own states and the international institutions so as to serve their own interests. We've seen that very dramatically in the past 40 years. I gave one figure, but we can extend it. So how do you deal with it? Same way that the general population has tried to deal with it all through history by creating democ functioning democratic societies in which the government is not our rulers, but our representatives recalled when we don't like them by our organizations, our uh, unions, other popular organizations working in concert to ensure that government is for the people, not against the people, the way you described, and not controlled by the masters of the universe, but by the populations of the world. That's a struggle that's gone on for centuries. I mean, back to the first English revolution, same thing. You go back to the first English revolution, the 17th century, and the way it's taught in schools, it was a struggle between the king and parliament. Parliament won, merchants and manufacturers won. There's a third element that's rarely taught, the population. They didn't want to be ruled by either king or parliament. You look at their pamphlets, the itinerant preachers and so on. What they say is, we want to be ruled by countrymen like ourselves, who know the people's wants, not by knights and gentlemen who do but oppressors. Well, that's 17th century. It's pretty much the same. Now it's taken different forms, but it's the same struggle and you have to keep fighting. Victories have been won. We're not in the 17th century. Victories have been won, not permanent progress. There's regression. We've just been 40 through 40 years of severe regression. Reverse it the way it's been done before. Just end with uh, my own personal history. 90 years plus. I was a child during the Great Depression, which I remember very well. It was a very severe crisis. Uh, the poverty, the misery are much worse than today. My own family were unemployed working class immigrants. Well, it was a there were several ways out of the Depression. One way was taken by continental Europe, fascism. A second way was taken in the United States by the New Deal, social democracy, headed, spearheaded by a militant labor movement, which was rising from the ashes that had been virtually destroyed in the, by the 1920s. It revived with militant labor actions. A supportive administration created a social democratic system, which was mirrored later in Europe, has lasted and lasted through the first couple of decades of the post-war era, after which it came under severe counterattack by the business world, which had hated it in the first place and was finally strong enough to reverse it. Well, it's a little bit of irony for people like me, my age who look at the world. At that point, the US spearheaded social democracy Europe descended to fascism. You take a look at the world now, almost reversed. Europe is hanging on 
barely to some of the tattered shreds of social democracy. The United States is moving towards a kind of proto-fascism. Canada has to make a choice. Where are you going to go? Well, choice was there 90 years ago. It's there again today. It's been there through all of human history. We know it has to be done. Problem is to do it. Thanks, Noam. We want to leave uh, some time for questions from the audience. And so I want to thank uh, Elizabeth May, Kimberly Wong, and Joey Hartman for their great questions and for Noam's responses. And I'm going to turn it over now uh, back to Bianca to uh, moderate the Q&A from the audience. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Kimberly, and Joey. Um, it's uh, it's so it's wonderful to be able to have these discussions um, and to have different conversations too from the ones that we are um, seeing currently shaping and dominating the media sphere. So thank you so much for participating in that. Um, so we now have a little bit of time left for the Q and A, and um, so we're going to start off our questions uh, with the youth voice. Um, we have a question from Lawrence Clausen, who's actually with the uh, Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria, um, and uh, runs a blog called Brain Tree, um, and is uh, currently pursuing a career in, in the U.S. Foreign Service. So Lawrence's question. Uh, to Noam is, in your 1967 essay, The Responsibility of Intellectuals, you wrote that lectures on democratic values are, a of a, are of monstrous irrelevance given the effort required to raise the level of culture in Western society to the point where it can provide a social lever for both economic development and the development of true democratic institutions in the third world. Considering the present day, do you think such a social lever is theoretically possible? Do I think that, say it again, the last phrase? Do you think that such a social lever uh, is theoretically possible? I'll it also just uh, put that in the chat for you. One way to proceed is to listen to the third world. Global South is not silent. In fact, if you look at the, they may be silent here, but that's our choice. They're not silent where they are. In fact, one of the major phenomena of the post second world war era is decolonization. Yeah. Colonization in Africa, Asia, and its own way in Latin America, created very important thinkers, activists, popular movements who had a conception of how the world should be organized. They called for what was called a new international economic order which would be geared to the interests of people, not profit. And they had detailed, careful proposals for this. People like Nkrumah, Nyerere, uh, 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 many others in Africa, Latin America and elsewhere. Well, they were silenced by violence. The main, the most probably the most promising leader of Africa in the most important country of Africa, Congo, gained its freedom from Belgium in 1960. Lumumba was charismatic young political leader who could have carried it forward. Uh, Belgian, Belgium and the United States took care of that by assassinating him and instituting a brutal, murderous kleptocracy, which lasts one day or another until today. Similar moves were made elsewhere. At the UN, the third world initiatives were crushed by force. A new economic order, new information order, in which third world voices could be heard, destroyed. But they're still there. And they're coming back. Non-aligned movement still exists. Uh, Council of the South, South Council exists. They talk, they have important ideas. They're disregarded, but they're there. So take, say, Libya, African country. When the crisis er arose in Libya, uh, 
the NATO powers moved in with violence, murder, destruction, and destroyed the country and turned it into a wreck, a wreck of warring militias. Right at the same point, the African Union had proposals for diplomatic settlement of the conflict, feasible proposals. It's not that they were silent. The voices were there, expressed themselves. We silenced them. Western power silenced them, said, no, we've got our way of doing it, bombing and guns and killing. We'll use our way. Well, we're in the West. We can stop that. We're the ones who can allow the voices of the global South to be heard, the voices of poor and working people in our own countries to be heard. Uh, we talk about China's repression of minorities, which is serious. We don't have that problem in exactly that way, because US and Canada had a better way of solving the problem of minorities, exterminate them. Exterminate them, you don't have to worry about dealing with them. That's the US and Canadian way. More the US than Canada, where some remain. Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be like that. That's our choice. Thank you. On the subject uh, of, uh, of bombs and, and war, um, we have another question um, from an audience member. Why would China go to war with the US? Both sides have nukes. Mutually assured destruction would prevent a direct war. They can't. And China is not moving towards a war with the United States. Uh, the documents and policies that I quoted were US policies. There's no counterpart in China. Let me go back to that New York Times headline that I quoted at the very beginning, China's leaning into the Middle East with investment, development, loans, and so on, as the United States somewhat departs from the Middle East, not with development, investment, and loans, but with <laughs> bombs, okay? And it's now, it's what's called a tilt to Asia. We now approach China with uh, a, uh, the encirclement policies based on violence that I've described. China's not encircling us. They're not calling for a war. They do lots of things that are wrong, very wrong. They can be dealt with regionally and by diplomacy and negotiations, not by violence, not by naval armadas off the coast of China, not by nuclear submarines, uh, not by th threats of encirclement, not by chipping away at the agreements with Taiwan, but by peaceful means based on mutual solidarity among people who have shared interests worldwide. That's what we should be working for. You know, so the here is um, somebody said that they on the chat that they have a 30 meeting and I'm afraid I do too in a few minutes. I have another talk coming up. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. So we'll just take uh, about another 10 minutes and then I'll have to leave. Perfect. Um, so we'll just take another two, two or so questions and then we'll wrap up. Thank you so much. So this question is, you speak a lot about US hegemony. Can you share your ideas about Canada's role in strengthening the hegemony? About, sorry? Can you share your ideas about Canada's role in strengthening US hegemony? Canada's been politely following along and helping. There was a famous Canadian diplomat years ago, I think his name may have been, John Holmes, who talked about what he called the Canadian ideal. Canadian ideal, he said, is to stand up for our principles, but to make sure not to follow them. Well, 
Unfortunately, that's been the Canadian role in world affairs. Others in Canada have discussed it in considerable detail. Justin Podor, Eve Angler, others. Thank you. Um, we have a, a quick question here. What does the what role does the waning power of the U.S. dollar um, at play in all this vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, Russia? Well, the U.S. is very significant. International transactions since the Second World War are almost entirely in the U.S. dollar. It means they pass through New York banks uh, or the SWIFT system happens to be abroad, but the U.S. controls it. That means that when the U.S. say imposes sanctions on Cuba or Iran or Venezuela, other countries have to live up to them. Why? If they don't, they're thrown out of the international financial system. Europe, for example, obeys. They don't like the U.S. sanctions. They hate them, but they obey. In the case of Cuba, the entire world opposes them. The UN votes are 184 to 2, US and Israel. In fact, even the American population opposes them. Doesn't matter. Power is in the hands of the masters, and they impose them, and the dollar dependency is one way to ensure that others do too. Well, China and Russia right now are looking at ways to develop an alternative financial system based probably on the renminbi, the Chinese currency, which would offer another possibility. Latin America tried to do it with, in fact, the BRICS, the South Global South tried to do it. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the BRICS. They tried to develop a kind of Bank of the South which could have led to an alternative system. But there they're fighting the concentrated power of Europe and its offshoots, which is overwhelming. And that's been hard. So yes, this is a very serious struggle. It's underway. It's almost certain that an alternative will be created. It's impossible that the United States can maintain this kind of dominance in an increasingly multipolar world but it's still there. Actually, you can see it with its extraordinarily lethal effect in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's facing a horrendous humanitarian crisis. A million people could starve. You can't, uh, Canadian, an uh, no, Afghan can't go to the bank and get their own money because mm -hmm. it's in New York and the United States refuses to release it. About $10 billion could deal very well with the Afghan crisis. The United States has also pressured the international financial institutions not to lend money to Afghanistan. It's basically revenge. If a million Afghans die, too bad. Well, that's part of the dollar-based system. The Afghan government had sequestered its funds in New York and the international transactions are dollar-based. So they go under US control. Plenty of people are suffering miserably because of that. Can't continue. Again, it's something that we can control. Thank you. And I think the last question we're going to take, um, is there someone who wants to know, sovereignty seems to be a persistent problem in the global relations that you describe. What is the future of this concept? The future of? Of the concept of sovereignty. Sovereignty? Mm -hmm. It's a tricky question. Take Europe, where an interesting experiment has taken place. For centuries, Europe was the most savage and violent place in the world. Uh, Europeans, their highest goal was to slaughter one another. Uh, 17th century, the Thirty Years' War, religious war, about probably a third of the population of Germany was wiped out. Uh, Europe developed a science of war, that it developed a technology and a culture of war, which enabled it to conquer the world. That's how Europe conquered the world, not with 
superior culture, economic advances. In fact, it was backward, but it was way ahead in the culture and science of war. Well, that continued until mid 20th century. After that, Europe started moving towards a form of federalism, European Union, slowly, painfully. Uh, there's a degree of cooperation instead of mutual slaughter, it's to the good. There are positive elements in the European Union, like free travel, study abroad, and so on. There are negative elements, which have to do with sovereignty. What happened as the European Union was formed was that decision-making power was taken away from national states where people have some participation and moved to a bureaucracy in Brussels, an unelected bureaucracy, unelected bureaucracy, so-called Troika, European Parliament, European Commission, unelected, IMF, of course, unelected, European Bank, unelected. They make the decisions. National governments have to work within their decisions, which, are, which limit them greatly. It limited the possibility for European governments, like Italy, say, to fund their way out of the recession because of the Maastricht agreements. Well, that's caused great anger resentment in Europe, understandable. It's a large part of the reason for the malaise in Europe and the rise of ultra-right neo-fascist movements. It's against the loss of sovereignty. So it's a mixture. These problems have to be worked out so that the federal systems become democratic. Not, they do take sovereignty away from local states but they vest it in institutions which should be under popular control. That happened in the United States. That the phrase United States was plural until 1865. It was the United States are, not the United States is. Many languages like Spanish, it's still singular. Estados Unidos is. Well, what happened is one of the worst wars of modern history, which turned the United States from plural into singular and uh, created a functioning federation with varying degrees of democracy. Some, not all, undermined, democracies undermined by the enormous power of what Adam Smith called the masters of mankind, largely dominate the government. Still, there are measures of freedom, interaction, and so on, and mutual support. So rich states like New York subsidize poor states like Kansas and Louisiana. Uh, ironically, they're the ones who are calling for states' rights, not facing the fact that they're being subsidized by the rich states, the richer states. Well. Those are some of the problems of sovereignty. They're not easy to deal with. We see it in modern history. We see it right in front of us. But these are the issues that have to be overcome optimally by international solidarity and international institutions, which will be under popular control. Thank you so much, Noam. Um, for sharing just your vast knowledge with us. That is all the time that we have today for questions. There's so many questions that we received, but um, unfortunately we don't have enough time uh, to get to all of them. Um, Noam, Noam needs to leave. We've come to the end of our event. I also want to welcome back uh, John and leave just a quick moment for any last words uh, from John or Noam before, uh, before we end for this evening. Thanks very much, Bianca. I want to um, thank Noam uh, for his wonderful uh, presentation and his responses to the question. And I take from Noam the point that he's made is that the uh, answers, a lot of the answers to the questions and the problems are out there and we need to pay more attention 
to what the Global South is saying, decolonization needs to be continued. So thank you, Noam, so much for uh, participating with us all uh, today. Really much appreciated. Thank you. Pleasure thank to be you. with you. Oh, thank you so much. All right, it's been a wonderful evening. Thank you to our audience at home. Thank you to our, uh, of, we, we had over 700 people on the call today. Um, on the Zoom event, so amazing. Thank you to our respondents, Elizabeth May, Kimberly Wong, and Joey Hartman um, for your insightful uh, questions and commentary. Uh, thanks to the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria, to Martin Bunton, as well as Kayla Klim, Jody Walsh, and Jessica McVicker, who've been helping behind the scenes. Thank you to the University of Victoria Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives as well for their support. And last but not least, thank you, thank you, thank you to Professor Noam Chomsky for taking this time uh, to share with us. Uh, we've all learned a great deal um, and it was wonderful spending time with you. So goodbye everyone, that's it for our program. Good night, peace. <laughs> Bye everybody.